morning I'm looking at verse 13 where we read, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Let's just bow before God. Father, as we have just read your word and are about to hear it being proclaimed, we pray for your spirit to be among us in both the preaching and the hearing of your word, that we may hear your words coming through, that they may strengthen us in our walk with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, this sermon has changed its title three times. Uh, when I first began this sermon, I called it the, the testing of our faith. But as I was reviewing it on Friday and Saturday, I changed the title to The Gift of Endurance. And uh, this morning as I was going through it, I thought it should be really be called Resistance Training for the Soul. Resistance Training for the Soul. And I hope that is clear as we go through. I want to begin by talking about a, a man uh, most of us have heard about. Uh, we don't know a, a lot about this man. We don't know his surname. We don't know where he came from, where he lived, uh, very precisely. But we do know him, and even our boys and girls may have heard of him. His name was Job. Job in the Old Testament. And we all know the story of Job, how Job was a very godly man in his age. But then things started to happen. Uh, God was in heaven and the angels came before him and Satan as well. And God said to Satan, consider my servant Job, there is none like him. And Satan said to God, it's because you put a fence around this man. If you took away the care you had for him, he will curse you to your face. And God said, very well, uh, you can take away everything he has, just don't touch his life. And so, over the next small while, uh, Job lost his oxen, his sheep, his camels, and finally all his children were killed. And we know what Job did then. He fell down in a, on his knees and humility before God he cried out naked I came from my mother's womb naked I shall return the, uh, the Lord has given the Lord has taken away may the name of the Lord be praised and a little while again later Satan, Satan came before God and God said to him look at Job you incited me against him but look at this man there's none like him and Satan said skin for skin if you, if, if you touch his health, he will curse you to your face. And God said, okay, you can touch this man, but just don't touch his life. He must live. And so then we find, Satan, uh, then we find Job struck down with this terrible disease, and he's sitting there scratching his sores on the ash heap. And his wife said to him, why do you hold on to your integrity? Why not just curse God and die? And God, uh, Job said to her, you're talking foolish woman. Uh, shall we accept good from God and not evil? And in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. In this story, we see two things at work, don't we? We see tempting by the devil. The devil tempting Job in order to make him curse God. And we find testing on the other hand, God testing the genuineness of Job's faith. They are two words in the English, uh, testing and tempting. But in the Greek, they are one word, the word pyrasmos. Pyrasmos means testing or tempting. It has the connotation of both of them because both of them are very closely linked together. When God tests us, Satan tries to use it to make us fall. And when Satan tempts us, God uses it in a positive way as a test of our faith. So these two things are one, testing and temptation. And the text I'm looking at today has a most wonderful promise. Verse 13, uh, God is faithful 
and he will not let you be tempted or tested beyond your ability. He will not let you be tempted or tested beyond your ability. And the general principle or maybe the presupposition behind this text is that as Christians we will be tested in our faith. Why? Because just like in Job's day, the devil still prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And on the other hand, we have a faithful father who delights in the gift of faith that he has given us and who's testing it, showing it to be genuine and making it stronger and stronger every day. Do you remember what James says? He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face various trials because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Or Peter in his letter says, your trials, uh, your trials come to you so that your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, may be proved genuine. Now there are three things I'm going to look at this morning. First of all, the testing of our faith is to test the genuineness of our faith. In the text we have before us, Paul is again um, quite sad as he recants the history of the Israelites, uh, his people, the people he loved dearly, but who so often through the Old Testament and New Testament times too, fell away. He talks about how blessed they were and early in this passage he says that they all were under the cloud. They, they walked through the desert and God was with them in the clouds. God had actually literally saved them through the Red Sea. God had baptised them into Moses. They belonged to God just as we are baptised into Christ. These people were God's own people. And they were under God's care in the wilderness. They ate spiritual food, the manna which was from heaven. They drank spiritual water, the water which came from the rock. God was caring for them. These people were so blessed because God had taken them out of Egypt and he was with them as they walked on to the promised land. Now for some people, this walk with God was a genuine delight. Moses, Hebrews 11. We read that Moses had not even been a slave in Egypt. He was a prince. He was considered as one of the sons of Pharaoh. But when Moses grew up, he no longer wanted to be called a son of Pharaoh. He far preferred to be identified with the people of God, with the disgrace that they had. For him, it was a far greater blessing. He said to be, belong to Christ was a far greater riches than anything that Egypt had to offer. He says, let me out of here. I'm going with God and with his people. It was a genuine delight for Moses to walk through the wilderness with God, the treasure of his life. But as we see in our text for others, this walk was not something they wanted to do. There's three examples or four examples that Paul gives in this passage. And he says these examples are given for us as an example and an illustration because their bodies were overthrown in the wilderness. And that is set as an example for us. So they grumbled. Many of the people grumbled, and we, we can't believe it, can we, when we read the story of the Israelites? And some of them began to grumble from the moment they left Egypt. They said, what are we doing here in the wilderness? There's no food, no water. Bring us back. And they completely forgotten all the slavery and all the whipping and the hard work they needed to do for the Egyptians. Bring us back, they said. And Paul mentions four examples here. The first was the, mention of the golden calf. The story of the golden calf. And we know that Moses was on the mountain communing with God, receiving his word. And while he was up there, the people were down the bottom. 
putting all their gold together and making a golden calf because they wanted to be like the nations. They wanted to worship like the nations. And we look at them and we say, how could they possibly have done that? God was so close to them and they were building this golden calf. But we shouldn't speak too quickly because how often also do we like to worship the things the nations worship to honour what they honour and to love what they honour, to love what they love. So this call to flee from idolatry is something which is not only real for the people then but for us as well, not to set our hearts on the things the world sets its hearts on. The second example he gives for us from Numbers 25 where 23,000 of the people died because they committed sexual immorality with the Midianites. And as we read that passage, they were worshipping the Midianite gods and they were brazenly committing sexual immorality. The third, third example he gives is when they grumbled. They said, there's no food or water. They said, we loathe, we loathe this worthless food, this manna. We don't like this manna. Give us something more. And it's exactly like us saying, why did you send Jesus to save us? Leave us alone. And the fourth example was from Numbers 16. That's the story we know of Korah's rebellion where Korah and 250 other people rose up against Moses and Satan incited them against Moses. And uh, God struck them down with an earthquake and then the people all turned on Moses and said, what have you done with the people of the Lord? And God was so angry with them that he sent a plague and many of them were destroyed. And these are just four examples. When we read through the Old Testament history, it dismays us to see how many times the people were tested and how many times they fell away. And Paul says in our passage, uh, these things happened as an example to us. They're an example to us that we might not desire evil as they did. Uh, these things happened to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And so Paul is saying, if you think you are standing, be very careful that you do not fall. Be very careful that you do not fall. The general principle is that our faith in Christ will continue to be tested as long as we live because the enemy continues to prowl around looking for someone to devour and our Father in heaven continues to test the genuineness of our faith. The second thing we see in our passage is the limitations that God puts on tests and temptations. Our faith will be tested. What sort of tests does this include? Well, in our passage, sexual immorality and other breaches of God's commandment. There are unique temptations today with the internet. These sins are always there to, to tempt us. Or maybe it's a supply of bread and water. We lack bread and water and maybe we become unemployed and make throws us on God for our supply. Maybe a test we have is unemployment. Maybe it's when the doctor says to us, you have cancer, you have six months to live. Maybe it's the death of a loved one. If someone very close to us dies and leaves us on our own, and we think, I can't do this on my own. Or maybe when someone close to us becomes seriously ill, and we become their carer, and it becomes heavier and heavier every day, we say, I can't do this, I can't do this. Maybe it's the loss of our wealth. Everything gets taken away from us. Or maybe it's standing up for Christ, the threat of loss, prison or even death. And sometimes with many of these trials, we look at trials that Christians go through and you say to yourself, I don't know how I would go. I don't know if I could stand. We have a wonderful promise in our text. 
It's actually a statement of God's absolute sovereignty. Something we need to hang on to. God will not let. God will not let you be tempted or tested beyond what you are able. Like with Job, God knew his servant Job. God knew what Job could handle. And God said to Satan, this far you can go and no further. And each time God set the boundaries in a different place. This far you can go, but no further. And how different this is from the health and the wealth gospel, which teaches that God does not want bad things to come our way. That if we are poor, that is not God's will. If we, are, if we have lost our health, that is not God's will. You need to be stronger in your faith. Reminds us of Job's friends, doesn't it? But what would these people do with Job? This picture of Job sitting on the ash heap, scratching his sores. You need more faith, they would say. Job, you need more faith. But if we could talk to him, he would say, No, Job, we know what's going on. Satan wants you to curse God, but God is testing you to see if you love him and if you trust him. And this sovereignty of God is a great comfort to us no matter what trials we are going through today. God will not let you be tested beyond what you are able. Sometimes he will stretch us. That's the point, isn't it? And that's why I said the sermon is resistance training of the soul. It's like in a gym, resistance training. You, you go as far as you can and then you press it one further. And as you keep on doing that, your strength increases. Sometimes God stretches us and we feel like, I can't do this, I can't do this. And then we're very much like Paul in 2 Corinthians 1. He says, we felt burdened beyond our strength. We felt burdened beyond our strength. So much so that we despaired of life itself. And he says, but this was in order to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. I can't do this. But I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That is what faith does under trial. We might despair of life even, but it drives us, it drives us to God. And God is absolutely sovereign. He sets the boundaries. He knows us. He knows what we can handle. And he is faithful. He loves us. He will not let us be tested beyond what we are able. The third thing we see in our text is the way of escape. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That you may be able to endure it. And again, we think of the health and wealth gospel. For them, the way of escape, God rescues us from it. We were poor, he makes us rich. We are, we are sick, he makes us well. But what escape does Paul talk about in our passage? He says it is an escape so that you may be able to endure it. As James says, the testing of your faith produces perseverance so that you can endure it uh, 1 Peter 2 verse 19 the same word is used one of the few times it's used in the New Testament and Peter says for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God one endures suffering while suffering unjustly this is a gracious thing when one endures suffering. Reminds us of Job. He lost everything. His, his wealth, his children, his health. He's sitting there on the ash heap scratching his sores. And in the midst of his trials, he remains mindful of God. And in the midst of his suffering, we find Job worshipping God. 
you find him, the Lord is given, the Lord is taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That is a gracious thing. It is a gracious thing when that happens. It's easy to be mindful of God when everything is going well in our lives. But what about when things go wrong? What about when things go south? It's a gracious thing to be mindful of God when everything goes against us. When God gives us the grace to endure when he has strengthened our spiritual muscles so that we can endure, so that we smile at the storm and next time we smile at a bigger storm and then at a bigger storm again, where our faith grows stronger, where we sing songs in the darkest prison, when our spiritual muscles are developing into full maturity. Let me draw it to a close again by referring to this wonderful example, Moses. Moses was a prince in Egypt, but like the Son of God, in who, who he would be an example of, Moses laid aside his glory as prince. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. He would far rather have been mistreated with his brothers and sisters rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He considered disgrace for Christ, fellowship with Christ to be of far greater value than all the treasures of Egypt. And the text says in Hebrews 11, he did not fear the king's anger. He endured. Why? He endured because he saw him who is invisible. That is what gave Moses the enduring power. He saw him who is invisible. He lived in fellowship with the living God. He walked in this wilderness of a place, but his eyes were set on the heavenly country. And as he walked through the wilderness, he relied on God for food and water. He was grateful. There wasn't a lot of variety of food, but... But what they had was of far more importance than food. They had fellowship with God. They, they, they saw that to walk with God with no food was prefer, far preferable than to walk with God, uh, without God without, uh, with plenty of food. By faith they drank from the rock. And the water they drank was better than the finest wine of Egypt. It's the cry of the Christian. I would rather die with God than live without him. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. By faith, Moses, in this barren wilderness, lived a wonderful life because he lived with God. He walked with God. He enjoyed God. He saw the invisible God. And all of his life was lived under the hand of God. But not everyone shared that faith. And so many of them, we are told, were overthrown in the wilderness. And Paul says they are examples for our instruction that we need to be careful that if we think we stand, we need to take care that we do not fall. As Christians, be mindful of this, that this life, this life is not our destination. This life is not our home. This life is still like the Israelites. It is the wilderness the, the shores of Canaan are still ahead of us. And we travel through this wilderness. And sometimes it's a, for us in the Western world a very pleasant wilderness. But a wilderness it is until we come to the promised land. And until we come there, until we arrive, many strong temptations will come our way. And many very difficult trials will come our way. And why does our faithful and sovereign God allow these things to come our way? It's resistance training. It's resistance training to test our faith, to try our faith, to strengthen our faith, to deepen our faith, to purify it and to make us complete. And yes, like Paul, sometimes we feel way tempted beyond our ability. I can't do this. And sometimes we fall. Some of us? No, all of us. All of us are sometimes tempted and fall. 
But what then? What then? Do you raise your obstinate face to God and say, God, I'm doing this my way? Or does grace make you even more mindful of the God against whom you have sinned and crush you and drive you to your knees? Let me tell you this, not one of us here will get to heaven without the horrible scars of sin, the bruising, the marks of sin, the memories of sin, the shame of sin. None of us will get to heaven without that. But neither will any of us get to heaven except we be on our knees in the wonderful realisation that we cannot live without him. And to our dying day, our cry is, Lord, remember me. Lord, be merciful to me. Lord Jesus, I love you. I thank you for what you've done on the cross. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. And so we see, even when Satan tempts us severely, God says, so far and no more. And even if for a time Satan has an initial victory, God has the ultimate victory. I'll share one story from my own father on Father's Day. Uh, I had mem many memories of my own father around the pool table. And he would challenge us all the time and he reckoned he could beat us with a broomstick and he sometimes did. And sometimes, you know, you'd have a good game and you'd sink all the balls, except the black. And you sort of had a bit, bit of a laugh at Dad and he would laugh at you and he says, the game's not over till the black ball's down. And he'd go and sink all his balls and the black as well and win the game. In the same way, Satan sometimes appears to have the initial victory. But the game's not over till the black ball's down. God has always the ultimate victory, the triumph of faith, the joy that God has in his children on their knees, singing out for joy. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. God tests us to bring that song out of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this Sunday, this celebration of the Lord's Supper which is the communion, celebrates the communion we have with you. Also Father's Day where we remember our fathers and our Father in heaven. And Father, as we have gone through this service this morning, we are mindful that uh, many of us in different ways go through different trials, trials of our faith, tests of our faith, and we thank you that this is not something unique, but that you allow these things to come and that you set the boundaries for every one of them. That even though sometimes we may feel like we are walking in the shadow of the valley of death, yet you are with us and you are guiding us and through your spirit you are enabling us to say, I can do all things, not in my own strength, but through him who strengthens me. And so be with all those who are going through difficult trials today. Be their strength. And Lord, continue to grow our faith. Make us spiritually stronger day by day. Even as uh, uh, we get older and the body wears out, may the spirit get stronger and stronger every day. Lord, help us to be mindful of the Israelites, many of whom perished in the wilderness. Help us never to... Take our faith for granted. Help us never to rest just on church membership. But may our faith always be in our only glorious Saviour, Jesus Christ, as the only hope of our lives. Be with us this day in the celebrations we have together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.